Welcome to Wisdom Talk Radio, a collaborative community of explorers in conscious living. What happens when a public speaking teacher and actress comes up against her own growing edge? So what gets revealed and what opens up? Which brings me to what do you, our listeners, our viewers, what do you need to move forward? How do you respond to that inner call when it comes to you? And, you know, it usually comes in the guise of something that you think you should be fearful of. And Because it's fearful, because it brings up some bit of anxiety, it probably is that thing that you need to do. Need as in it's your growing edge. It's it's what comes next for you and your own evolution and your own revealing of yourself to yourself. So stay tuned today for a provocative conversation that will invite you, I think, into a new relationship with yourself. I'm Laurie Seymour, host of Wisdom Talk Radio and CEO and founder of the Baca Institute, home of the quantum connection process. Head there to discover your unique connection with the essence of who you are by taking the quantum connection quiz. We are each designed to connect with source differently in our own unique way and directly connect with source, that which gives us life. And knowing your own style opens a deeper connection with yourself. And it really is the secret to creating what you truly want in your life. Because who you are is exactly what is needed. Karen Fitzgerald is my guest today. And she is an award-winning public speaking coach and speechwriter who helps her clients lean into their edge and build confidence in the public arena. As a keynote speaker, solo show artist and actress, and musician, we might hear about that too, singer, she brings decades of personal experience from challenging her own edge. Welcome, Karen. I am really excited that you're here and you're looking so beautiful and red. And if you're listening to the podcast, find it on YouTube so that you can see how gorgeous Karen looks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Laura. You too. <laughs> I return the compliment. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Mm, it's really a pleasure. And, you know, when we when we were talking a couple of weeks ago, I, we were we were talking about so many different things and we were talking about okay, how do we want to to craft this show? What is it that that feels like it's wanting to emerge and be spoken to? And and so the, that theme of of being on your edge, the theme of the things that you have been doing and done in your life that are are that that way of stepping across the threshold and that have definitely pushed you into some places that you might have been, kind of surprised <laughs> about. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Totally. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. From, yeah, I, from my early, from my early desires, from my early desires mm-hmm. as a young person to this age now, and I'm 70 years old, I might as well just say it up front. And, um, and you know what, by this time, and I'm going to say it too, by the time this show comes out, I will be 70. (laughs) Happy birthday. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the the pushing the edge. Um, So I will just start out. Do you want me to just start just get going and see what go for it? Go for it. Because I'm really I'm really interested in um, it's like two parts to it. What has stopped you? And what has afforded you the, the space to move forward? What has stopped me, I think, is what stops a lot of people, and particularly women. What mm-hmm. has stopped me is uh, be a good girl, play small, mm-hmm. don't be too noisy, don't be too much, 
don't be too, you know, just keep it status quo. And uh, it started, I went to 13 years of Catholic school and <laughs> that'll do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I figured you'd know that. And, um, and, you know, I got a lot out of it. There's, there's a lot of spiritually that came out of it, but, but as a little girl, as a little tiny girl, uh, my mother, my mother and father met on a dance floor during World War II in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. right? And my dad was in the Navy, all of that. So they were dancing from the moment they met. And when I was born, my mother said she thinks I was born dancing. Mm -hmm. And at the age of four, she finally put me into dancing school. And, and I did that for 10 years. And then I got to be about 13 years old. And I was a little bit heavy. And I was getting teased a lot by my brother. And I got uncomfortable in my body and I stopped just as they were asking me to become the student dance teacher at the studio. Oh, and, and I really wanted it. I wanted to be that girl and I wasn't, I walked away from it. And, um, and so that kind of story, I got a lead in a school play in high school and I won, I won a voice thing for the all state chorus. Right. And both things I won. And then I backed out of, I backed out and I and and I said it was to help my family, which was true. I was working full time. My dad was alcoholic. You know, we had all these things going on. But the truth is, as I did my own spiritual work much later, is that it was anxiety. And I was afraid mm -hmm. I wouldn't I wouldn't be good enough. Mm -hmm. I was afraid that people would find out that I had no talent or no skill or whatever. And it was fear. It was absolutely fear. Yeah. And that pattern continued that pattern continued until I, I got married I had children uh, I had two little ones and they were adorable and I married a man and I won't get into all of that other than to say we both came from troubled families and the marriage was the lonely one and rejecting on his part and all of that mm. and I was desperate to find myself and I was 32 years mm. old and I heard about an audition at a local theater company. And the audition was Godspell. And um, and I went, I was terrified. I read it in the paper, then I put it away. I said, I'm not going, this is not gonna happen. <laughs> and every day in the mirror, I was walking by in the mirror singing day by day, <laughs> every day. Mm. And, and I it was a local theater company. And the night of the auditions, I went up the stairs in this old town hall. And there were about 50 people, all young people from the local theater company. And uh, I walked in and they were all much younger than me. And I was terrified, but I could do the dance audition. So I did that, I did that fine. I could do the reading audition and then I had to sing. And my knees were shaking. They all had their music in front of them. I had to sing acapella because I didn't have any music. And um, a couple of days later, I got invited to be one of the lead characters. And I said, no, I said, no. And the director said to me, what's the problem? I said, well, I have children, I'm new here. I don't have any daycare. She said, I run a daycare center. She said, no, I provide you. <laughs> and I said, oh, I have to go back to New Jersey. We just moved all this stuff. She said, well, no, well, you know, you could miss it, you know. And so she would let me out of it. She would let uh -huh. me out of it. And I wound up mm -hmm. doing it. I wound up doing it and I fell in love wow. with her. Thank God, right? <laughs> really? I mean, I couldn't stand it if you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning. That was the mm -hmm. beginning of and walking through the absolute terror. I wanted to run down the stairs and I have auditions. And, um, but I went through it. She sort of forced me into it and I fell in love with it. And, uh, and that began a trajectory of a, you know, 15, 20 year career of, playing lead roles in theater. And, wow. Um, wow. And that's how, but that was only the beginning of all of the right, stuff. Right, right. All of the anxiety, all the stuff. So right? let me ask you, why Why do you feel like, why are we talking about this now? Why are we talking about the whole issue or aspect of, of leaning into your growing edge? Yes, that story kind of gives a foundation, but I, but I know that there's a whole other mm, dimension to what you have been up to <laughs> and, and, and how this has moved you in your life. Yeah. I think, I think we're being called. I think we're being called. I mm -hmm. think anybody who's listening to your podcast, people who have a spiritual attunement, people who have 
I think we're being called in the world in a big way. And it might not be, you may not be singing on a stage. You may be doing healing work. You may be called to do something else. And frequently we stop ourselves. We absolutely stop ourselves because we're afraid or we have, we feel imposter syndrome or we, you know, whatever it is. And so the reason for any of these stories that I might tell, because it's been a, a theme throughout my life, uh, is that we stop ourselves and how hard is it to push through it? And then what happens when we do, but the, but the world is calling. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So what happens when we push ourselves through? So what happened for me in that instance was it was terrifying and then it was exhilarating. And then I started to take acting classes and voice classes and I started to build the skill set. And I went out to do some of my professional theater and then professional theater. It became less frightening. Once you once I walked out of the once I walked through the fear, once I walked mm-hmm. through the fear and actually did it and did it a few times, it became less frightening. And the exhilaration was much greater than the fear. And it became this most enjoyable thing. And then and then I did that for several years until I had to go through the next step of, of evolution. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so what was that next step? The next step was uh, I knew I had to get it. Oh, this was this was huge. Mm-hmm. I had known for many years I had to get a divorce. Mm-hmm. And um, the marriage was really awful. I mean, it was really, he was a workaholic. There were other many deep emotional problems. I was getting help from my own family history. He would not go. And I won't get into all of the details about that. Mm-hmm. But I kept saying, I kept praying about it. And I kept saying, I have to go once mm-hmm. my daughter, my youngest, goes off to college. Like, mm-hmm. I, and, mm-hmm. and he was the financial center. I was the mom. I took care of everybody. I, you know, all that, but he was the financial and I was terrified and I was terrified. And it took me 25 years to leave a marriage that I should have left year one. Mm. It took 25 years to go. And the terror of that, and how am I going to make a living? And am I going to be all right? And do I trust the universe? And all of Mm -hmm. that was just remarkable. And it's, it was like having my feet in cement and not being able to move them mm. until, until circumstances, the universe put circumstances in my in, in place that said, you cannot stay here anymore. It's not safe for you to stay here anymore. Wow. So it's it's sort of like um, the director saying, uh, I run a daycare center. Right. And, and so you, you talk about circumstances and, and I, we could hear about that, but hmm. There had to have been something within you that could answer that call, that could finally come to that place of saying, it's not just knowing it, I'm actually going to do it. And are you asking about, about the about the theater piece or about the like divorce piece? About the divorce piece. The divorce piece. Well, you know, I've heard it said, and I'm going to, on Oprah, <laughs> when I used to watch <laughs> Oprah, you know, as many of us did, mm-hmm. uh, she would say the universe is going to tell you something and initially it's going to be a wink. And then if you don't get it, it's going to be a little knock in the head. Right. (laughs) And then if you still don't get it, it's going to be a two by four. Right. And I got a two by four about what was going on in his personal life when he was traveling. I will say that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was pretty big and it was pretty frightening. And, Mm -hmm. And my being, my body, so my head kept saying, you can't go. What are you going to do? How are you going to do this? My mm-hmm. body kept saying, you're not safe if you stay here. You're not safe if you stay here. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so it was that feeling of uh, competing fears, hey, perhaps? Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and I had done enough study and enough to like listen to the body. And I was in therapy at the time. Mm-hmm. I had a therapist and a spiritual coach. And the therapist kept she said, what is it going to take for you to move? What is it going to take? And so she gave me some tools. She gave me some, some thing. And then she finally said, I got the name of a very fierce, I want you to interview lawyers. I was terrified to do it, but I did it. I interviewed five lawyers. Finally, she said to me, you have to make a decision. And she gave me, she went digging and she got the name of the toughest lawyer in New Hampshire. 
<laughs> and it was validated by a friend of mine who was another therapist the same week, the same name. And I went, all right. So I went to talk to this woman. I'm terrified of her. She was very scary. Um, but she took the case and she proved to be perfect. Uh, but it was every step of the way was like trying to lift my foot out of the cement, mm -hmm. like trying to lift my foot. And I did. And I did. And ultimately, um, ultimately, for a divorce, it went pretty well because I was praying the whole time for mm -hmm. him and for me. And he would call me every week and he'd be really angry about my lawyer. And then I would talk him down. I would calm him down. Mm -hmm. You know, we did all that through 18 months. And the last day we went through a lawyer mediation. And the last day he said, do you want to go out for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> and, we did. and we just kind of went, all right. And he said to me much later, he said, I know you didn't just do this for you, but you did this to free me too. And I said, yes. So wow. it went as well as a divorce could go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it was, it's that, I don't know if that's answering your question, but it's that my body, my body knew, my body knew that I had to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and ultimately with the help of spiritual therapist, a lot of spiritual guidance, the universe was really, mm -hmm. I felt like I, I felt like I had, an army of angels, both on this planet and in the beyond. I felt like you I did. I did. I mean, I let's know. just let's just face it. You did, and and because you were willing to to receive that and allow that, <clears throat> you felt the support. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and intuitively, what started to happen? I was so surrendered at that time. Probably the only time in my life I've been fully surrendered. But I started. I started to really hear. And I'd been doing so much reading. I started to hear like, okay, this is the next step. Mm -hmm. the next step. And it was mm -hmm. one by one. It was the whole thing wasn't going to be unloaded on me. It was just take the next step. No, it and it's not. Because if we get the whole picture, this is something that I've shared with clients a lot is sometimes if we get that, you know, full, okay, this is what it's going to be like for the next trajectory. It's too overwhelming. It's too scary. It's too big. Yeah, exactly. And it sort of reminds me is when I was asking for directions about how to get to a hotel in a, in, in a city in France. And he, the guy gave me all these directions and I couldn't get all of that. I needed, you know, give me the next step in French, but okay, but give me just one step. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, the energy sort of guidance is like that. Yeah. And you were willing to, as you said, to surrender. Yeah. 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 It was the most, Beautiful. It was the hardest time of my life and the most beautiful at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and started, I, I guess, I think it really, I mean, I was praying all the time, but it started me on sort of the spiritual, a deeper spiritual trajectory. Because at night, my therapist had me journaling all the anger, all the pain, all the everything. Mm -hmm. I'm sobbing at night, you know, literally crawling on the floor in anger. And then I would sort of shed all that with tears. And then I would go out on my back deck outside mm -hmm. and frequently when I was looking up at the moon and suddenly this electrical energy shot through the back of my neck and down my spine and I was overcome with gratitude and with grace mm. just it happened many times it happened many times yeah and then as I started to heal that went away and then I started chasing it <laughs> 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 which didn't work by mm. the way it was a no. nice try. <laughs> we, we, we didn't talk about this at all in our initial conversation. So I'm really moved to hear about all this. And I want to say, come to our Tere meditation sessions because you'll find it. <laughs> oh, good. All right. I will. <laughs> it, it, so you've taken, you know, these steps. It sounds like it's been a theme in your life. Oh, yeah. What's current for you right now? What feels like it is that growing edge again, or that 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 edge of your own being where you know you have to step into it, and you've you've had the the um, the history of knowing that that works for you. Yeah, I the, I think the thing that's coming up because as you mentioned in the bio, I teach public speaking, right? Mm -hmm. I have been a keynote speaker. I won't tell the story about that other than the first time I did it, the terror was beyond, beyond. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 
And I, I did it. And the first woman who hired me to do it, I quit on her four times. <laughs> and she was a coach, thank God. And she nudged me forward. And I finally did it. And it went great. You know, and they all turned out great. That was the thing. You know, all of these mm -hmm. different steps. For now, what it feels like, what it feels like is uh, I had started teaching. So I teach public speaking and I particularly work individually with people about uh, one woman that's working with me now is a very successful corporate woman and she wants to do a TED talk about you can have it all, but not all at once. And so we're really digging through the stories and also digging through her fear and digging through her resistance. So mm. And I really interview and help elicit all that. But what I did also in terms of communication uh, with a friend of mine for a while, we were teaching a class called Spirituality and Sexuality. Mm -hmm. And one woman got in touch with us and said, how dare you put those two words in the same sentence? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and you got to know something about her. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, but also my friend, a lot of these were her clients, her former clients, and they'd been through huge trauma, addiction stuff, all of that. Yeah. So I, I really got it. But I have studied a lot about women's empowerment and particularly women's sexuality. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became certified as a Tantra educator and I mm -hmm. did orgasmic meditation and I did a variety of these things because I had to heal from my very rejecting marriage. Okay, so mm -hmm. I did a ton of that work. What it feels like maybe I'm being called to do is, you know, as I teach, finding your voice for women, and it's about communication, finding your voice in the bedroom or the boardroom, right? Now I can teach mm -hmm. the boardroom. I have taught in the boardroom, not the bedroom stuff, but just the public speaking stuff. Right. And I taught at the Fortune 100 companies. I did all that. Um, but this, even at the Fortune 100 companies, we had a CEO woman come up to our boss, who was a very good Catholic boy. And he said, you know, she went for a coaching session with him. And he said, well, what can I help you with? She said, how can I ask my husband to have more sex with me? And he, mm. he turned beet red. He couldn't even say it to us. He couldn't even say it to us. And I said to him, well, you should have sent her to me. And then he got even more b red. So that was just a, that's a conversation that never went anywhere. Um, but it is, it, is, it is a topic for women just to be able to, to step up and to even start to understand what they want. Like mm -hmm. how do I even articulate it to myself? And then how do I articulate it to another person? So it's a communication thing. And I feel potentially like I'm supposed to be out there teaching about sexuality at mm -hmm. some level. And, and that good Catholic girl, <laughs> you know, I even wrote a solo <laughs> show about this, which is actually pretty funny. Uh, but mm -hmm. it, it is, uh, it's terrifying, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, here's the questions, you know, first of all, some of you have had more sex than I have and probably better sex. Okay. Um, the, the Catholic education, obviously I'm 70 years old. Who the hell is going to want to listen to me talk about it. Right. And who wants to hear about 70 year olds having sex anyway, which is not. The <laughs> I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I know. Me too. Um, so you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, it's all of that fear and mm -hmm. it is, and it's, and it's big, you know, I have dodged it. I've avoided it. Um, and yet I feel that I, that I want to talk about it in a, in a very respectful way. Mm -hmm. And I want to enable, I, I had a friend of mine who knew all the things I had studied. And when I moved up here to new England, she said, I want to hire you to be my sensuality coach. And we, and she did. And, mm -hmm. and, and she has a lovely marriage, but things were kind of dying out and all that. And she hired me and she was astonished, but the stuff I was, the tools I was giving her, ah. and it was not hard, but it was things that we don't know. It was, we're not educated about any of it. And it is the core. It is part of the core of who we are. Our sexual energy is just, you know, it's the life force. It's That's what I was going to say. Yes, it is the life force. And it's, it's, it's our creativity too. Exactly. We don't exactly. always have to express that sexually, but if if we are, well, we are creative beings and exactly. we are designed to, as my friend Jennifer Huff likes to say, create upon creation. And given that, and that our sexuality is that, is 
that generative life force tell us what what do we what do we need to know that we don't know first of all i'm going to use a word that's been and i don't have the answer to this one but i'm just going to mm-hmm. we've been so domesticated we have been so domesticated as human ah. beings as and and actually in, in my spiritual group somebody brought up the word, word it was a gentleman, very lovely gentleman, but the, the women have been using, I want to know how to rewild. Mm. And, and what does that mean? And and in terms of what we don't know is the capacity, the capacity, and I've seen it with people and I've heard it, and to some extent I've experienced it with a much younger man. Mm-hmm. It's the capacity through the physical body to touch each other's hearts and to touch each other's souls. Mm. And frequently in this culture, we don't even know how, it, partly it's taking time. Partly mm. it's it's holding each other close and harmonizing our breath and breathing together. Partly mm. it's greeting your love, I mean, there's little tiny things, but partly it's greeting your loved one in the morning and holding them close and saying, I've missed you. I, I, I wanna spend time with you later, or I love you. Mm. Or, you know, I, the little things. I mean, that's the beginning. That's mm-hmm. the beginning. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, there's so much more. But it is, how do we connect? Because we are so disconnected. And once we connect, mm-hmm. once we trust, and once we can feel safe, then we can allow our fantasies, our desires, our, like, what what is this force that lives in us? And how do we express it? And how can we say it? And how can we say no? You know, if it's something that's happening for us. I was dating somebody this past summer, lovely man, but he wanted me to fall in love with him on the third date, <laughs> which didn't happen. Oh, but come anyway, on, Karen. <laughs> but anyway, we had we had a little bit of uh, intimacy and it was lovely. And then in the middle of it, and we were just starting to date. And he said, I love you. And my body shut down. Mm-hmm. And he said to me later, and we had already talked about all this stuff. And I, he said, why, why did you suddenly shut down? I said, because you said, I love you. I said, mm-hmm. I know you expect me to say it back. I can't do that right now. And I said, and I felt manipulated and I shut down mm-hmm. because I, that's what I felt. And to be that honest with somebody is something that we don't know how to do. Right, right. Right. We're not willing to do. Well, of course, I I might hurt his feelings. I might, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. unless we learn how to communicate and be kind about it. I mean, I was kind to him. We had already had this conversation. It was a very Mm -hmm. gentle conversation. Um, And I was kind in this one. I didn't yell at him. I just said, this is why. Um, We don't know how to do that. And that, Yeah. 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 That, well, it's 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 something that I was thinking about earlier th- this morning is is about discontent, contentment, and discontentment, and how as women we are we are supposed to be contented. We are supposed to be that epitome of contentment, and <clears throat> when things are not okay, we're still supposed to be content. <laughs> and the value of discontentment the value of honoring our own discontent and and even our discontent in the world when to have that um as an, an old old teacher of mine used to say the the sword of of uh, of righteousness you know going into battle and allowing that discontent to to attend to what is dark what is what is not okay and to be able to say it and to be able to, which is part of that expression of discontentment. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I mean, this whole thing, you know, me teaching communication skills and public speaking and all that mm-hmm. is how do we find our voices in a culture? Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not saying this particular culture right now, though. Yes. But, but mm-hmm. the past, I mean, you know, I did a, um, a workshop several years ago with a big spiritual teacher. And it was a woman and she talked about, um, it was a whole weekend workshop and she wanted women to get more politically involved, spiritual women. And she mm-hmm. 
So she did this workshop and, and she showed three consecutive movies on three consecutive days. And the first one she showed was a PBS special on the Salem witch trials and how the healers and the midwives and the women mm-hmm. were burned at the stake for, for being who they were, for, mm-hmm. healing, for opening their mouths. Right? right. And so, you know, I saw that I've since read a book about it. I think it was Barbara Ehrenreich wrote mm-hmm. the book. Um, Mm -hmm. which is midwives and I forget the name of it, but anyway, and I thought, no, that's, it's not that big a deal is why we, it is that big a deal. It's that big a deal about why we've kept our mouths shut. And then she showed the second day, she showed a movie about the women getting the right to vote in the 1920s and the, the horrors that they went through Mm -hmm. to get the right to vote and to try to shut them up, try to shut them up. And so, um, and then finally, she showed one with the women in Liberia opening their mouths. And the movie's called Pray the Devil Back to Hell. And, ah. uh, and, and, and it's a documentary. But it is about women finally finding their voices and coming out in the world and speaking of discontent, stopping the wars, stopping, you know. Um, and, and so all... And, and Liberia that- had one of the first, I don't know if it was the first, but the, certainly the first woman president in Africa. Right, right. And it, and it was really Johnson. Yeah. And yeah. it was part of that. It was part of that. So wow. it's, yeah, the whole, you know, and it's been an exercise for me. I mean, to, to step, do I do it all the time? No, do I, no. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm, it's been a lifelong journey of learning to do it. Mm-hmm. And helping other women do it as well, both in the bedroom and the boardroom. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that bedroom and boardroom. That needs to be in your in your uh, uh, bio too. I sure it does. I know, but I've hesitated, <laughs> right? I've hesitated. I've okay, hesitated. so tell me, why have you hesitated? What, because, what is that? First of all, I I was working in the corporate world for a while. I I still work with corporate people, though I'm not mm-hmm. in corporations, right? I still work individually with corporate people, and um, you put something about the bedroom on a website. Right. And forget it. I mean, you know, because there's all of the rules about what we don't talk about, which is legit in those environments. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. legit. Um, but so I didn't put it on my website. And then, like I said before, you know, um, who am I? Who am I? Mm. Yes, I've studied this. I've studied it. When I when we got our Tantra certification, most of us said to our teacher, you know, <laughs> There's so much more to this. There's so much more to this. How can we? And he said, you already know 99% more than most people out there because most mm-hmm. people know nothing. They're right. learning it. The men are learning it from porn. The women are learning it from romantic comedies. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. It's like, what? what is this life force and what is this essence? And um, so it's really imposter syndrome. It's really um, fear of being ridiculed. Mm -hmm. Fear of humiliation is one of the biggest fears that human beings have Mm -hmm. and um, fear of that. So, so then what's what's the other side of that? You know, in other words, what could you gain? What's the potential, you know, when we, when you step through this and, and here we are right in this moment, truly of, are you willing to claim this? I'm here now <laughs> talking to you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's yes. And I have been in the process after, after I finished, after I finished the Tantra certification, uh, I connected with two friends of mine who are also studying these things. And we taught for two years, we taught um, an intro to Tantra class in New York city. Mm-hmm. And then the woman and I um, co-taught for, a period of time um, about women just finding their own sexuality, feeling into their own bodies and mm. the women loved it. And then we taught, we taught, um, <laughs> we taught a course in how to pleasure your partner um, and using Tantra techniques. And we did that and that was pretty popular, but she was willing to go the distance. She, she'd had quite a bit of sexual experience in her history and she was willing to go the distance. She became a teacher and all of that. And I didn't market it. I didn't mm. market myself that way. And so, um, and I don't know if that answers the question, but. Well, it, but perhaps there's a different, I mean, you're not going to do what she did because you're not her. 
Exactly. But what is it, you know, I hear you already being who you are, and yet maybe there's just some little crossover <laughs> of maybe we'll get to standing today. <laughs> yeah, of, of standing in it. Right, yeah. right. That well, the crossover of standing in it is there's there's a particular joy when I see women light up. Right. So mm-hmm. when when I have taught, I taught these things online when all the COVID stuff happened. Mm-hmm. And I would teach them. I, I talked to you before we started this about pole dancing that mm-hmm. I did that I did in New York City. So I was in New York taking 11 years of women's sexuality classes. I took pole dancing classes. I took Tantra classes. I took all <laughs> of these things. I mean, I had to heal this thing. Right. And so a few weeks ago, um, a friend of mine was doing an online retreat for her clients, her private clients, all women. And she asked me if I would dress in red in some of my sexier stuff and mm-hmm. do the pole. Not, I don't have a pole, so it wasn't pole dancing. <laughs> it was, but it was, um, but it was sensual movement to a sensual song. And mm-hmm. how does a woman move to that? And as I did that, and then I sang for them, and then I talked to them for a while. The joy that came out of those women, that's the that's the reward. Yes. That's the reward. When I taught the Tantra classes in New York, and I did it singularly when I first moved up here a couple of years ago, um, women would say, oh, my God, just that we're talking about it, that we get to mm-hmm. ask questions, that mm-hmm. we get some information, that we get to talk about. It. It's it's exhilarating. It's exhilarating when I do it. And, and it and it. You see women who are walking around in a very adult state, mm-hmm. adult state, you know, just like going through life, plotting through life. All of a sudden, it's it's this, it's this. Yes, it's, yes. It's awakening, and it's and it doesn't mean they're going to run out and have sex tomorrow. They might not, but but they're dancing and they're singing and they're feeling yeah. that force. I mean, the, the woman I'm uh, doing the TED Talk thing with. She's African American and she's gorgeous. And she said, when she hired me, she said, I also want you to tell me how to dress. She said, I want you to tell me how to dress. She said, I want you to tell me how to. I said, okay. I said, so I'm going to start right now. And she said, what? I said, the next time we got on a Zoom, I said, I want you to wear hot pink because she wears black all the time. And I said, why do you wear black? And she said, because I'm in a man's world, in the business world, and I hide. (sighs) And I said, okay. So I said, would you be willing to wear hot colors, possibly hot pink, some long dangling earrings, some, you know, she shows up the next time, gorgeous. (laughs) And she said to me, I used to dress like this as a teenage girl. And then I lost it. I damped it down because I was in a man's world. Mm -hmm. So what I want to teach women, even that is to liven it up. Like, how does the outside, how can you use the outside dressing in red to match what you want to feel on the inside? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's that, it can start from there to what conversation do you want to have in the bedroom? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So what I want to feed back is the joy that I see in you as you speak about all of that, as you share all of that. I mean, you talked about the joy in the women and that's what I'm looking at right here in your face. Yeah. Yeah. So it feels like, you know, you've got to do this. I know. know. We're just going to start our first conversation. I know. I know. (laughs) Like what's the edge? Like what's the edge, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I thought you get to be a certain age and there's no more edge, you know, like you don't have to push anymore. You don't have to push. You don't have to push. There's still an edge. There's always an edge. But the edge is there. Uh, You know, another thing, not about sexuality, but this year I hadn't acted because I was a leading actress up in this area for a Mm -hmm. lot of years. And I hadn't acted in a play in 17 years. Mm -hmm. And I got an email in December from the regional theater company, they knew I was back here and they wanted uh-huh. me to play the lead in on Golden Pond, right? And, uh-huh. and, I, and I, I went like this, <laughs> I said, <laughs> okay. And we had two weeks of rehearsal, 
two weeks of rehearsal. It was terrifying and it, it was good. And the audiences loved it. And what it did, it pressed my edge. It pressed right. my edge. I was going right. to say no to it. I was going to say no. What am I doing? And I, and I did it anyway. And I did it anyway. And mm. so that's part of the, like for anybody listening to this, if you're being called to do something and you know you want to and you're scared and you, you know, it's just like, ah, next step. You mm-hmm. know, uh, the, there's a famous woman in Hollywood, Shonda Rhimes, who's been, you know, huge. <laughs> and she Great. wrote a book. She wrote a book called The Year of Yes. And she said she said no to everything in her life other than her TV work. No to everything. Mm-hmm. And she, um, her sister challenged her on it. And she decided to have a year of yes. And it changed her life. And so that's kind of where I'm at in my life these yeah. days is the year of yes. Wow. That's yeah. so profound to me. Yeah. Because I'm coming into a phase in my own life where I, I recognize mm, for a lot of my life, I said no. Somebody would ask me something and I it's not that I would I would always say yes to places where I was scared and to growing edges, but there were so many things I said no to, usually around joy and pleasure. <laughs> Silly me. And um, we talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, and I'm and I'm really recognizing that that's part of this time in my own life is that if I don't do say yes now, when will I say yes? And uh, there's been a lot of loss recently in my life and a lot of wonderful new joy. And it it is such a profound time of saying yes, of looking for what will fill our own cups. Right, right. And the idea of, I mean, pleasure, pleasure is what I studied for 11 years. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, mm-hmm. it was sensually oriented, but it's pleasure in a thousand ways. It's pleasure mm-hmm. in, in the clothes you're wearing. It's pleasure mm-hmm. in the music you're listening to. You know, it's pleasure in will you allow yourself to sensually move around your house? You mm-hmm. know? Even if you're vacuuming. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But it's it's pleasure on any level. It's pleasure on any level. And and we don't and we don't allow it. Mm-hmm. We don't allow it, you know. You know, I realize, and I've never thought about this before, and I've certainly never said it because I haven't thought about it. That's one of the reasons that I do Wisdom Talk Radio and why I've kept at it for almost seven years is because this brings me joy and it and it brings me pleasure. It's 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 the it's the conversations where you get to really see someone and hear something new and perhaps learn something or find yourself like for me in this moment, expressing something new. Right. Um, that's that, that way of connecting with another is, it is really very joyful for me. Yeah. I get, I see it. I see it in you. Mm-hmm. I see it. And same for me. I mean, when I can yeah. have, that's why when we discussed having this conversation and, and you said, I like to go deep. I said, go, <laughs> <You know? laughs> just go, you know, toss it out, see where it goes. Uh, because I, I enjoy that. It's, yeah. it's a great gift to me. One-on-one having rich conversations, deep conversations, frequently mine go from the depths to laughing. I mean, it's just, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's that, you know, yeah. and, um, and back again. So I, I get it. I know why you've done this for seven years. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah. So yeah. Karen, will you um, share with us how and where people can connect with you, where, where they can find you, somebody that they're doing a talk and they want to, they want your help. They, or they want to know about, more about their own sensuality. Sure. Sure. So it's, it, you can look up my website and it's Karen Fitzgerald TV. So it's Karen Fitzgerald.tv and it's K-A-R-E-N-F-I-T-Z-G-E-R-A-L-D. Kind of like Ella Fitzgerald, but anyway, (laughs) it's not related. Um, Karen Fitzgerald.tv and there's a contact page and you can go to the, and it's, it's a pretty new website because I had Mm -hmm. to change a lot. So it's very simple right now, but you can go to the contact page. You can email me and, you know, we can set up like a 20 minute conversation and Mm -hmm. see what you're looking 
looking for and um, be happy to do that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's profound and fun work mm -hmm. you know, either way, whether, whether you're doing, whether you're learning to find your voice in the bedroom or in the boardroom. <laughs> <laughs> or on a TED stage. <laughs> or on a TED stage. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Karen. Thank you for your willingness to, to be who you are, to show up as who you are and to share with us from your own experience. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. This has been wonderfully joyful. Oh, I'm glad. I am and really illuminating. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And so thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to have a mm -hmm. chat with you. Yeah. My pleasure. And thank you to our listeners, our viewers, for being with us live here today on Wisdom Talk Radio, because you're the reason we're doing, well, you're part of the reason we're doing this. I would want to do this anyway with Karen, but <clears throat> Knowing that you get to be part of the conversation in your own way and in, in being able to witness it allows you, for one, to be able to join us for the wisdom, the discovery, the illumination that happens. And so come back again, come back again and again, and <clears throat> know that you can find us on your favorite place to listen to podcasts. And, and if you've enjoyed listening to us today, please, please, please leave us a review. When you leave us a review, what that does is it lets other people know, here's something special to listen to. And that's how we spread the word. And that's how we spread, spread the transformation. That's really what we're about. <clears throat> and for more about how to thrive with your own personal quantum connection, take the quantum connection quiz over at the Baca Institute. See you next time. Thanks for joining us here at Wisdom Talk Radio. We wish you well in your conscious explorations. For more information and to join in the conversation, our website is wisdomtalkradio.com or at Wisdom Talk Radio on Facebook.